bringing the people behind our food to life. What is a commercial uh, forager? Well, so we have commercial foragers that are all over the country, all over the world. Uh, and these are people who are working in the woods uh, and they are literally going into the woods and hauling out nature's bounty. Uh, these are foods that we can't grow ourselves. Uh, they're not domesticated. So somebody has to go find them. And so there are foragers who have sort of filled that niche. And in this country, this is relatively new, especially with mushroom picking. We're talking really the last 30 years or so. That's kind of when foraging sort of started becoming big and trendy and you know restaurants all of a sudden were thinking about having wild foods on their menu and people were asking for them and uh, farmers markets started carrying them and all of a sudden the sort of the local the organic the wild uh, these were you know catchphrases in the in the food world uh, and so a whole industry has emerged to fulfill that demand uh, you know say 50 years ago there really wasn't much of an industry. Uh, it got going in the late 70s, early 80s with restaurants like Chez Panisse in, in Berkeley um, and others around the country that really prided themselves on, on serving local organic foods and ultimately wild foods. Uh, that would be sort of the pinnacle, if you will. Um, you know, anybody can grow, well not anybody, but a lot of us can grow a really great tomato, but going into the woods and uncovering nature's secret bounty is a whole different level. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these foods suddenly sort of came into vogue uh, and there were foragers there waiting to kind of fill that, you know, that, that need. Um, and it also happened to coincide with the downturn in the logging industry. So you had guys who worked in the woods for a living, who knew where the mushrooms were, uh, maybe they were out of work, needed to make some money. There were restaurants that were willing to buy these. Uh, and so, you know, it was a way to make a little dough. Um, and it just kind of went from there. And now it is, I mean, it's still very, don't get me wrong, it's still very kind of ragtag and, and uh, fly by night. And it's, it's not, it, I, I refer to it in the book as kind of frontier style capitalism. Uh, so it's, it's not, you know, you're buttoned down you know, style, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's happening out there in the woods. It's the largest all cash business in the country that's legitimate. Give me just a, a feel, the overview of what this culture entails. It's kind of old school. I mean, it really, it has echoes of the gold rush to it. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a lot of people, I would say, who are somewhat disenfranchised. Okay, um, so in terms of the pickers, there have been really three major waves of mushroom pickers in this country. The first wave, and this got going kind of late 70s, early 80s, would be what I refer to as refugees from the old economy. Okay, so these would be, say, ex-loggers, ex-commercial fishermen, uh, guys who worked outdoors for a living, got laid off, needed to make some money, knew where the mushrooms were, could bring them to market. That was the first wave. Then the second wave, which really kind of came into play kind of early to mid 80s and is still kind of part of the game, these were refugees from actual wars in Southeast Asia. Okay, so Southeast Asian immigrants primarily. Laotian, Cambodian, Vietnamese, Hmong, Mien, etc. Um, these folks came over uh, and many of them settled on the west coast. Uh, they were near where the mushroom picking was happening. And, and by the way, mushrooms get picked all over the country, but it's really the greater northwest where most of the industry is taking place. Um, and so, you know, if you can imagine, a lot of these folks, uh, they harvested wild foods in their home countries. They were familiar with the woods. They came over here, they didn't necessarily speak the language, they didn't have marketable skills, uh, but they could go and they were comfortable in the woods, they were used to foraging, this was a way to make money. Uh, so they were the second big wave. The third wave is happening right now and it's essentially an offshoot of the migrant trail out of Mexico. So largely Latino um, and um, 
you're seeing a lot more Latinos in the woods picking mushrooms than even just a few years ago. Uh, and when you think about it, you know, you could be stooped over in a strawberry patch for 12 hours a day making minimum wage, or you could be out in the woods wandering around looking for that mother load. You know, maybe over the next ridge is, you know, a little sort of cash bonanza. It's very American in that way. The sort of the sense of optimism uh, that goes with it. The idea that if everything, if the cards break the right way, that you might be able to make a little windfall. Uh, and so there's this sense of hope that goes with it. And it, I mean, it's just, it, it makes total sense that the immigrant experience is tied very closely uh, to mushroom picking. Then of course you have the buyers. Uh, and they tend to be, uh, I mean, again, uh, it just, it really depends. I, I don't want to lump them all together. I mean, you have all kinds of different buyers. And in fact, a lot of the original refugees, uh, especially from Southeast Asia, are now buyers. Um, so they've been kind of moving up the food chain. But then you have other guys, like for, for instance, Jeremy Faber, who I profile in the book. Uh, and he, he's an East Coaster originally, a New Yorker, uh, had a forestry degree cooked as, you know, as a chef in kitchens and had that whole food piece and decided that he enjoyed being in the woods. So, you know, he, he had become the house forager at his restaurant where he worked and eventually just decided he was going to become a full-time forager and started his business. Uh, so, you know, you have people from all walks of life, but there is this kind of sense of optimism, of hope, of uh, sort of gold rush mentality that goes with it, uh, the treasure hunt, right? Which I think affects all mushroom pickers, recreational or commercial. I mean, I'm a recreational mushroom picker and I get that gold fever. You know, when I'm out there looking for morels in the woods and I finally spot that first one, I mean, there's no way you're getting me out of the woods. I'm going to look for the second one and then the third, you know, and, uh, and so there's this, you know, there's this attraction for some of us about being outdoors, in the wild, uncovering nature's secrets, and, and just spending you know, time away from the hubbub of the city, and just being out there in the woods, uh, which you know, I think attracts a certain type of person. Describe for me the two uh, main characters in the book. I, I wanted to profile a picker and then on the other side of the coin, a buyer. Uh, so I, I met up with Doug Carnell, the picker, and I knew right away that he was my guy. Uh, and when I first met Doug, it was in Hoquiam, Washington, and this, uh, this meeting had been arranged by a mutual friend. And, uh, and I met Doug, you know, at a, at a coffee shop, and, and basically when he's in the field, he just drinks coffee. You know, that's it. I never saw him drink water. I never saw him eat anything. Uh, he just subsisted on these big cups of coffee. He was dressed, you know, almost entirely in cotton. You know, the sort of things that, you know, if you're a backpacker, you would never want to be in cotton because it's just not a good type of clothing for rain and cold and, and that sort of thing. But he was, he had a whole, you know, array of, 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 um, of, of hoodies that he would, and if one got soaking wet, he would just throw it off and throw it in the back of his car and get another one. You know, I never saw him with a compass uh, or a map or anything like that. He just went into the woods with his bucket and, and picked mushrooms. Uh, and it's something that he's been doing for 30 years. So Doug uh, had worked on a crab boat uh, he'd been a commercial fisherman, he'd been an old growth logger cutting big coastal red cedars. Uh, he had worked as a ski lift operator, he'd done all kinds of things. Uh, but for the last 30 years, really the constant on his resume was picking mushrooms. Uh, and so he lived in Westport at the time, and he would travel down to California in the winter to pick mushrooms, and he would move up the east slope of the Cascades in the spring to pick morels and spring porcini. And then he would pick the patches uh, sort of close to where he lived in the fall for porcini and lobster mushrooms and chanterelles and 
hedgehogs and all that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, he would be what's known as a circuit picker. A circuit picker basically follows a year-round circuit through the greater Pacific Northwest. Uh, this is one area of the country that you can pick year-round. Every, every day of the year you can pick mushrooms somewhere in the greater Pacific Northwest. Uh, and so he would follow the mushroom flushes and I just started tagging along with him in his old beat up you know, Buick Century Wagon that we would drive around in that he called the Blue Pig. And, uh, and we would just go from patch to patch and, uh, and he, would, he would pick as many mushrooms as he could every day and sell them to the buyer. Uh, and some days, you know, he would scout and he wouldn't be picking. Uh, but, you know, if you're gonna be picking for a living, on good days, you really, you need to pick large volumes of mushrooms. And this is what I've tried to explain to the recreational mushroom hunters, just how crazy it was to be out there in the woods with these guys and just see them, you know, the amounts that they were picking. You know, to really make a living, you need to pick 100 pounds of morels or 100 pounds of chanterelles. Um, you need to go out there and, and grind it out. And just being able to find those sort of quantities, to me, seems superhuman. Uh, because it's kind of like nature's Rubik's Cube. You need to you know, work all these combinations out between uh, humidity and soil type and slope aspect and tree canopy and all these different factors go into where the mushrooms might be hiding. Uh, and these guys, the professionals, they just have a Rolodex in their head of, of, of mushroom patches, you know, all over the West Coast where they can go at a certain time of year and know that they can find the quantities that they need to be able to pay for their gas, get food, you know, lodge themselves somewhere. And sometimes, you know, it's just a base camp in the woods. So, so, so Doug... You know, and he was a character, and he just, he showed me these patches, and a lot of mushroom pickers are pretty secretive. Uh, and I had to wade through, you know, meeting up with quite a few before I found someone like Doug who was willing to take me under, you know, his wing and, and show me the secrets behind it. And he's just a, he's a teller of tall tales. Uh, and I write about a lot of it in the book and you know I had to do a lot of digging to sort of find out you know sort of separate kind of exaggerations from truth and whatnot I mean he's just had a very colorful life uh, so he was a, he was a perfect character and then on the other side of the coin is Jeremy Faber the buyer uh, and he is just an intense guy I've never met anybody who works harder than him uh, he's in the, he's either in the woods or he's driving to the next patch where he knows mushroom pickers will be coming out of the woods that night to sell to him. Or, you know, he's loading up mushrooms to go off to the airport to, you know, ship down to San Francisco or out to New York, uh, or Boston. Um, and he's just always on the road or in the woods or somewhere. I mean, he does not sleep as far as I can tell. Uh, he's very entrepreneurial. Uh, you know, he started this business, Forged and Found, uh, which is based out of Seattle. And he basically, what he does is he serves all the best restaurants in Seattle and elsewhere with wild foods. Not just mushrooms, but all kinds of different wild greens and berries and mushrooms. And um, it's, it's a tough, tough job. The, the margins are thin. Uh, and he's dealing in what's known as, as uh, fresh market. Uh, and so fresh market, a lot of these uh, wild food purveyors, especially on the mushroom end, will mostly be selling dried product. It's much lighter, often, you know, a tenth of the weight of a fresh mushroom, uh, and they'll ship them to Europe and elsewhere. Uh, but Jeremy is mostly dealing with the fresh market. So he's really battling time. He needs to get those mushrooms out of the woods into his van, back to his warehouse and into a cooler, and then boxed up the next day and driven around town by his employees to the restaurants, uh, and they'll make the deliveries, or else on a plane that night 
you know, to New York or wherever because these are perishable goods. Uh, mushrooms have a fleeting life. Uh, you know, after a couple of days, they're not good anymore. Uh, and so he's really battling time. Uh, and he's, he is, again, just like Doug, but in, in different ways. Uh, I just knew right away that he was the guy that I wanted to follow around. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I tried to pick the sort of characters that would flesh out the book that would just, you know, sort of be able to tell their own story themselves. Uh, both of them are great talkers and uh, they have many stories to tell and just tagging along with them was incredibly fun for me. It really does come out in, in your book. These people are very, uh, they're, they're very human. I, I'd like to get more of a feel for your experience when you were working alongside them in the woods. What that, you know, what was going through your head at some of those times and, yeah, that's a good question, uh, because it took me a while to get comfortable. And uh, at first, I really felt like an interloper. And I tell a story in the book about how the first time I was out with Doug, and uh, we're walking through really dense second growth forest. And actually, and I like to remind a lot of the recreational pickers about this, because they're worried that the commercial pickers are harvesting all the mushrooms and there won't be any left for them. But my experience was that rarely was there overlap between where the recreational guys went and where the commercial guys went, except maybe at a burn site for morels. Uh, but otherwise, rarely did I see recreational pickers. And one of the reasons is that we worked in really tough woods. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Mushrooms, a lot of the mushrooms that we have on the table are mycorrhizal with a type of tree. Uh, and that means they have a symbiotic relationship with that tree. So the tree and the mushroom help each other out. They exchange nutrients and water and things like that. Um, this is especially important when the trees are young and when the forest is young. Well, we happen to live in an area where there's been a lot of, a lot of logging. Uh, and so we have a lot of managed timber forests. We have a lot of young forests um, that are managed for timber, for lumber. And, uh, and these places, they're not easy to walk through. They're not pretty forests. Um, they can be really dense and tangled and there's old logging slash from the previous cut 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, so there's stumps and there's snags and there's lots of brush. Uh, and it's tough going. And so the very first time I went picking with Doug, uh, he took me to one of these forests. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a, a pretty area. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's a forest that's kind of recovering from being logged. And it was maybe a 20-year-old forest. And, uh, you know, it had its own virtues to it. And I remember there was actually a lot of evergreen huckleberry. And, uh, and Doug pulled off some of these huckleberries that were ripe and he was eating them and he asked me about them and I said, oh yeah, I love those. Those are huckleberries, you know, they're members of the vaccinium genus. They've got all kinds of good antioxidants in them. They're really healthy for you. And he said, oh yeah, well that must be why this time of year when I'm in the woods and I eat these berries and it just makes me want to run around. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And run around he did because he just sort of took off through the woods and uh, we were on this little, really, I mean, you'd hardly call it a trail. It was sort of a goat path. And it, I realized that it was a path that he had made, uh, kind of like the bears and the deer and other animals that move through the woods on their regular paths. He had created a little path through this woodland to pick mushrooms. And so we were moving through it, and he was just whipping through the, through the forest, and I was having trouble keeping up. And eventually, I just kind of lost sight of him. Uh, and he was up there in the tangled regrowth of the forest. And I couldn't see him anywhere. And I got this paranoid thought that crossed my mind. And this was, this was the very first time that I'd gone out with him. The book project was new. In fact, I had not sold the book yet. It was sort of, I was thinking about it. Um, but this is really at the beginning stages. And this paranoid thought crosses my mind that maybe Doug is testing me. You know, maybe he's seeing if I'm kind of up to the task. 
Uh, and I thought to myself, maybe it's like, you know, with guys in the military or, you know, cops or firemen, you know, maybe I'm being hazed right now. You know, maybe this is sort of a ritualistic hazing. He's spinning me around in the woods and he wants to see if I'm man enough to find my way out, you know. And then, of course, I heard his voice up ahead and eventually I found him and I sort of chastised myself for not believing for a moment. And Doug says, come here, you got to see this. And so I catch up with him and I come up and I'm on this rise, sort of on top of a ridge and he just points. And I look down into this ravine and there are mushrooms everywhere. And they were hedgehog mushrooms and they have sort of creamy caps and they really stood out against the kind of the greens and the browns and the earthy colors of the woods. Just these sort of white beacons. And uh, I mean, they were just everywhere. And it was like this secret had suddenly been revealed to me. And it was, it was just an incredible moment. And he kind of looked at me and in that sort of laconic way of people who work in the woods for a living, he said, it's not much, but you know, we'll get a bucket out of this. You know? <laughs> so we went and picked the hed hedgehogs and I thought, this is my guy. This is the guy I need to be following around. And that's when I asked him, I said, Doug, you know, I love these mushrooms. I'm a huge fan of hedgehogs. They have, they have kind of a spiciness to them that reminds me of like black pepper and cloves and other sort of exotic ingredients and they're really meaty and they're just delicious. Um, and I said, Doug, you know, uh, this is one of my favorite mushrooms. How, how do you like to cook it? And he thought about the question for a second. And he turned to me and he's sweating, you know, because he's working. I mean, all, while I'm asking him questions and taking photographs, he's working. And he stooped over cutting some mushrooms and he looks up at me and he says, you know, I haven't eaten a hedgehog in six or seven years. And that's, you know, I mean, so much crystallized for me with that comment. Um, you know, they're the equivalent of cash for Doug. You know, I, I thought going in that the mushrooms, um, wild mushrooms might be very lucrative, but all in all, when you take all the risks and all the costs and all the uncertainties, at the end of the day, are the Jeremy's and the Doug's, you know, do they have a retirement account? Are they able to build, you know, anything for the future? Well, Jeremy's a businessman, so his situation's different. Um, you know, he's higher up the food chain. I think for the pickers, you know, most of them are disenfranchised. Uh, there's a reason why they're mushroom pickers. Uh, and in some cases, it's just because they want to be out in the woods, or they want to be left alone, or they don't want to have a boss. They don't want to have someone looking over their shoulder. They just want to be out doing their own thing in the woods. Uh, so people pick mushrooms for different reasons. Uh, but um, it's a hard way to make a living. It's stoop labor. It, it takes a lot of work. Uh, you need to be smart out there in the woods. You can, you can get lost. You can get hurt. Every year a picker dies of exposure in the woods. So, uh, you know, it's not, it's not an easy way to make a living. And it's, you're rarely going to come across that windfall where you actually make pretty good money. It happens occasionally. Uh, one of the pickers I spoke with told me a story about picking in Idaho after a burn uh, when it's really good morel picking and uh, he said he cleared about thirty thousand dollars that spring picking morels. Prices were high, he found a great patch to himself uh, and uh, he just, as they say in the business, he cleaned it out. Uh, and then he went to Costa Rica or something <laughs> for the rest of the year. But, uh, but for the most part you know, pickers aren't making that kind of money, generally speaking. 